Well, greetings. Good Sunday morning to you. I'm recording this a little bit ahead of time in case I don't make it back for Sunday the 23rd. Uh, if I do make it back and I'm too tired uh, to teach, then the lesson will be taught and I will listen to my twin brother Frank teach the lesson. Uh, some of you that don't know that, don't know that joke, ask the other folks and they'll tell you. Um, glad to be here today for part nine of uh, Following Our Messiah. We're finishing up today the section that's taken from the book Don't Waste Your Life by John Piper. And then next week we'll finish the whole series by going through the book uh, Leadership, Christian Leadership by John MacArthur. But we're going to finish today with, on your outline, um, we're going to finish point E, Jesus, his credibility, and then we're going to do stewardship and uh, godly prioritizing. And um, I think you'll enjoy this as much as I've enjoyed studying it and preparing it. Father, uh, help us today. We really want to follow you, and you know what we're like on the inside. You know the battle that we face between the spirit and the flesh. The Spirit wants to follow you all the time. Never go anywhere except where you want us to go. I'll never say anything or think anything or do anything other than what pleases the Father. And that is such a blessing when we allow the Spirit to do those good things through us. Uh, help us in this battle and help us today to, to give credibility to who Jesus is, his character and his life and help us to be good stewards of everything and uh, that you've given us and everything that we are in this life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, a couple of quotes out of Piper's book. Um, and when I wrote this down, I, I put beside it, is this really a true statement? He says, you don't waste your life by where you work, but how and why. Stopped and got to thinking about that, and I thought, you know, um, I'm not sure that that's a completely true statement, in an accurate statement, per se, um, because um, some people work in good places but waste their life uh, by not doing things to honor God and to please Him, by not serving in the place of service they are. There could be missionaries or pastors they go through their whole life in ministry, and when it comes to the judgment seat of Christ, there'll be nothing there for them because of what they did, um, not what they did, but why they did it. Um, and so it's a it's sort of confusing. We talked last week about the fact that the context of your work is not as important as the motive, the dedication of your work, the sacredness of it. And so I think that is a little more accurate of a statement than what Piper's was. Uh, but I, I also think I know what he was talking about. We mentioned last week that um, being content with Christ is clearly indicated when we are content with our stuff, realizing that it's not our stuff, it's his stuff. When we don't have to have more and more and more when we don't have to have bigger, better, different, whatever. Um, when we wisely use the question, do I need this? And uh, if I do need it, for what purpose? And for whose honor will I possess this? Will I own it? And at any time, if it's his, then he can take it back. He can uh, tell me to give it to someone else. He can tell me to take it and completely use it for his work uh, by giving it to someone who needs it in his ministry. Um, so the indicator of our contentment with Christ is whether we are content with what we have and in many cases content with who we are. Uh, so uh, realizing that my stuff is not my stuff, it's his stuff is very important. Um, Let's look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. And while you're turning there, um, I have a couple of sort of penetrating quotes I'd like to read to you. 
a story about Alfred Nobel, the Swedish businessman, invented dynamite. Most people don't know that. They know him for the Nobel Prize, but he invented dynamite. In, 19, in 1888, his brother died in France. A newspaper editor, thinking that it was Alfred Nobel who died, wrote this obit, The merchant of death is dead. The man who got rich by helping people kill each other is dead. Alfred Nobel read that in the newspaper and resolved to use his wealth to rewrite his legacy. He died um, about eight years later in 1896, but he left $9 million to fund awards for people who helped humanity, the Nobel Prizes. <laughs> so that's what he's remembered for and not the... Um, the fact of how many people were accidentally killed by mishandling dynamite. Uh, he's known by the honorable Nobel Prizes. Um, how will we be remembered? What will be the bottom line when people think about us? Um, what will be the thing that runs through their mind? What would our obituary say? Um, I know some people that write their own because they're afraid of what someone else is going to write about them. But you know what? We write our own obituary. Now, every day, we are writing our legacy, our obituary. We are giving the memories to um, our work associates, our friends at church, our kids, our grandkids, by the way that we live for God each day. Consider these facts about giving in the church in America today. The average Christian gives 2 to 3% of his income, wealth, of his increase, as the Bible says. Um, not much. In the average church, 10 to 25 percent of the people tithe, funding 50 to 80 percent of the expenses. Um, is it right? Uh, no. Is that the way God planned it? No. God bless the people that are giving 10 to 25 percent. Uh, they are doing what they're doing as unto the Lord and not unto men. And they are taking care of God's business. And they're the happiest of the people. Um, my parents, uh, when they were in their 60s and 70s, were the happiest old people at the time. I was younger, so I called them old people, and now I am one. The, the happiest old people that I knew because they were generous. They shared. Uh, they didn't consider that what they had was their own. They considered it that it belonged to God. Um, Sam Houston, uh, the statesman, made a profession of faith and was baptized. He promised at his baptism to pay 25% of the pastor's yearly salary. He said, when I was baptized, my pocketbook was baptized too. That's an old term for uh, not a woman's purse, but uh, a wallet. My granddad used to call his wallet his pocketbook. A.W. Tozer said, As base a thing as money often is, it yet can be transformed into everlasting treasure, according to where it's invested, of course. It can be converted into food for the hungry, clothes for the poor. It can keep a missionary on the field, actively winning the lost, and thus produce heavenly value. Any temporal possession can be turned into everlasting wealth. Whenever it is given to Christ, it is immediately touched with immortality. Wow. I think of that, that what you give when you give it to God is touched with immortality. Um, if it's given to Christ, it's because we counted it worthless. We had that mental yard sale and gave it to him, gave it to him for his disposal. We may give things to him now, and he says, okay, hang on to it, um, and, and I take good care of it, and I'll collect it later. So whether we ask for it now or later, um, it's, it's touched with immortality because it's in the possession of the master. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I couldn't remember the name of the Sunday school member of our class uh, from years ago, probably 20 years ago. 
that came up to me after we talked about stewardship, after we talked in a Sunday school uh, Bible study about uh, giving to the Lord and considering all things but loss and taking things that maybe we don't use there of a value and liquidating them and using the money for God's work. He came up to me afterwards. Stan Williams came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I've got a Bentley in my garage. He said, I love it. It's a little roaster, a little convertible Bentley. Um, people love that car. Everywhere I go, people look at that car. That's always been sort of my toy. He said, I don't need that. Um, I'm going to sell that and give the money to God. And as far as I know, he did. And it was what God asked of him. And I like what came out of the In His Steps books. At the beginning, the pastor said, don't compare yourself with somebody else in this matter of stewardship and giving. You do what God tells you to do when he tells you to do it and how he tells you to do it. And don't worry about the other person because the Holy Spirit knows exactly in connection with the Father, exactly what the Father wants you and me to do as individuals. Hudson Taylor, uh, the famous missionary said, the less I spent on myself and the more I gave away, the fuller of happiness and blessing did my soul become. Um, the the greater, the more on the other side equaled the greater and the more blessing and joy and happiness and satisfaction on the other side. Craig Bloomberg with the uh, Matthew Commission wrote an article called Storing Up Treasures. And he said this, focus on compassionate use of material resources in order to meet the physical and spiritual needs of others that goes back to two weeks ago, the Apostle Paul saying what it meant for him to follow Jesus. It was all about others. The Apostle Peter said the same thing. It was all about serving Christ and because of that, serving others. And uh, Bloomberg says, uh, in order to meet the physical and spiritual needs of others in keeping with the principles of God's kingdom. Uh, Amazing, awesome words about stewardship. Um, finishing up uh, two verses on credibility, and this ties back to what we said last week, but it connects to this week also. Philippians 3, verses 9 and 10. Paul says in verse, um, verse 9, that I may be found in him, and the, the Greek word means to have people watching you and the conclusion is that you belong to him. That's what Paul was saying here. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And then he says in verse 10, that I may know him, that is to fully know him, that complete knowledge, the same that we talked about back in the book of John, that Jesus said when he fully knew that all things had come to pass and the power of his resurrection that I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him, found in him, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Um, people look at you, their conclusion, you belong to Jesus and not to yourself. Uh, what happens when we give ourselves to the Lord, when we follow him? Um, we have that excellent knowledge that he said back in Philippians chapter 3, that exchange of all things that we give away in exchange for the excellent, surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus, our Lord, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Um, we give credibility. Uh a famous, a very famous pastor from Texas resigned his church a couple of weeks ago. And um, we don't even know at this point, we don't know what the sin was. But he said that it happened sometime previous. It wasn't just right now. And that he knew that what he'd been telling other people, he needed to 
resigned from the ministry because he told others when they sinned, they needed to step aside and repent and then work through a process and seek to be restored. And uh, he did that. Um, and the problem that, in my mind, this week was all the time since he did that sin, when he was preaching and teaching those things, basically he wasn't telling the truth about himself. He was laying out this standard for everybody else as if he was keeping that standard. Um, when the deception, when the sin was uncovered, I wondered how many people that have read his books, how many people that have heard the sermons, uh, that have met him in person, been in conferences where he was. He was just in a big Southern Baptist conference back in April or May. I wonder how many people, their faith has been eroded by his fall. And how many people have wondered, well, if these things were not true in his life, then where was the truth in the rest of the things that he said? Um, we've got to be very careful because what people conclude about Jesus and what he's like and his power to save a person, to change a person, to keep a person, uh, those thoughts are formed in somebody's mind by them watching someone who calls themselves by his name and says, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, let's look at point E, uh, I'm sorry, point F, uh, stewardship. Uh, how stewardship trumps security. I already read the, the uh, quotes about stewardship, but let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Interesting passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You notice the statement I put there beside uh, point E, the American dream may not be God's dream for us. Um, we need to find out what God's plans and what his dream is for us. Uh, there's this big emphasis here in our country on the American dream. Apparently it's children and um, a home, a house, and uh, other possessions, a car, whatever. And if you have those things, you have the American dream. And people come from all over the world for this American dream. And many times when they get here, they're very disillusioned because the satisfaction in those things is fleeting. Um, see what he says, uh, what Paul says to the, the Corinthians there in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. <clears throat> He's talking to a Corinthian church, which was fairly well to do compared to other churches. And uh, he talks about this church, this Macedonian church, which was very poor. He said, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace. I circle and connect that word grace in verse 1. I see it again in verse 6. Um, I see it in verse 7. I see it in verse 9. Um, I connected all those. It's the same word which means graciousness, a, a graciousness, a givingness almost. Uh, he said, I want you to know about the graciousness of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. And notice the contrast here. This church of believers, notice the, the extremes here. For in a severe test of affliction, one side, the negative side, their abundance of joy, it, it doesn't seem to go together, but it does. The graciousness of God had been bestowed upon these people they were grace givers, gracious givers. They realized it was God that they were given to, and it wasn't a matter of how much money they had, but it was a matter of how much of themselves the Lord had and how much at his disposal they were. Um, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, the positive extreme, and their extreme poverty, the negative extreme, have overflowed in the wealth of generosity on their part. It's just bad, good, bad, really good. Um, 
this is this has got to be God. And that's the point that Paul was making to these other churches that these people who had nothing and were in severe trials, they were living it up spiritually. They were having some good times. Uh, the word there, generosity, means sincerity without self-seeking. It means copious, generous bestowal, giving to others uh, graciously, generously, uh, not in self-interest. You're not interested in yourself. You're interested in other people. Um, overflowed in the wealth of their generosity on their part. They gave according to their means what they had, the potential of what they had. As I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. In other words, nobody forced them to do this. Um, some early believers in Ukraine that came to Christ on the first trip when I went over there. When I came back the next year, I had Bibles to give these four guys and um, discipleship materials. And it was amazing that two of them out of the four, I didn't get to see the other two, two of them out of the four had begun to go to a Bible preaching and teaching church. And they knew so much of what was in the discipleship materials. And I said, who told you this? And they said, God did in his word. And now I knew the way it was over there. Sometimes the pastor ruled with an iron fist and sometimes what he said was what people were supposed to do, whether it was actually in here or not. There was a lot of tradition taught, and it was it was the law of the land in some churches. But these guys said, now the Lord told us this, this is what we know he wants us to do. And that's what Paul says about these people, that, that their generosity just overflowed in the middle of the trial and affliction that they were in. They gave beyond their means. Uh, verse 7, there's an interesting, I don't know what it says in your translation, but in mine it says, but as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge, in all earnestness and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace or graciousness also. Uh, twice he uses the word excel and he connects it with everything. You are going beyond what is expected of you. You are being generous beyond what people around you are being generous. While you're not comparing yourself to them, you're, you're just saying, God, what do you want me to do? Um, I tell people many times when they're comparing themselves with others, it can be depressing. It can be boastful and prideful when we compare ourselves with other people. But if the judgment seat of Christ, he will compare you with you. It will be the fullest extent of what you could have done as a believer in Jesus Christ from the time you came to Christ until the time you breathed your last breath. The fullest potential what you or I could have done compared to what we did uh, who will we be compared to? Well, obviously to Christ. But because that's an unfair comparison, he's perfect. He's God's son. Uh, he will compare me with me, my potential, all these opportunities I had, all these possessions that I had, all these uh, abilities that I had. What did I do with them? How much did I invest them? <laughs> so he says, you excel in everything and in all earnestness, all dedication of heart to do these things beyond means, beyond what you have. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? Well, it's, a lot of people get the faith promise principle from this. If you don't have something, but you know that God wants you to give, then you ask him. You say, hey, I don't have this. How? What can I do? He might give you a job to go out and work for it. He might, if you look along the road, like my dad always taught me to do, you might find what you need sitting along the road uh, that blew out of somebody's trailer and they, they haven't come back for it. You go by it three or four days in a row, it's open game, then pick it up. Um, some people that used to go to our church years ago, um, we walked into Sunday school 
And the guy looked at me and he said to his wife, he said, well, I thought I thought they weren't even here today. And I said, why would you think I wasn't here today? He says, because we went up the interstate and there was a perfectly good lawn chair sitting out along the road. And I knew that you'd gone to church before we did. And I said to my wife, I said, well, Fred must not be at church today because that chair wouldn't be sitting there. He would have stopped and picked it up. So there are many ways that God provided for us in giving beyond our means way back when there were just two of us in Minnesota. Um, we first started giving faith promise. And uh, let's see, two years after we moved back to Minis from Minnesota to Ohio, um, I had 99,000 miles on my, on my Chevy 2. And uh, Dad said, I think we need to check the brakes. And he said, you still got pad on these brakes, both the front and the rear. How, when did you have them changed? I said, Dad, I've never had them changed. That, those are the original brakes that were on the car. And I didn't think of it at the time. But later on, I told Beth, I said, you know, honey, we've been giving um, the amount that we knew that God wanted us to give to missions. And in the meantime, he's just, my brakes aren't wearing out. They're just not wearing out. He's paying back in an extra blessing that way. If we notice, then he will be honored when we praise him and thank him. And uh, I have no doubt in my mind that that's why those brakes went on 99,000 miles. We didn't change them until I think 125,000. And that's just God. That's just him and his graciousness. And that's the, the word from verse one. We want you to know, brothers, about the graciousness of God. When we see him and his outpouring to us and through us we say well okay what can i do i want to, i want to give more i want to do more i want to be more for you um let's look at the next uh, point godly prioritizing uh there's a little statement after that and put this down and it's important to remember only his best and nothing less um there are a lot of ways to to measure what we give or, or how well we do. Um, but in the matter of prioritizing our life, God has best in his mind and heart for us. He'll guide us through his spirit and through his word to find his best for us. And we should never satis be satisfied with or settle for anything less than his best. And that doesn't mean the most expensive. That doesn't mean the flashiest, the most abundant of whatever. It just means that if we've got, and this is why I have trouble choosing sometimes. I say, okay, God, eliminate the options. I, I don't know which to choose. I, I Sometimes I can't pick. I, I never used to like to go into Cabela's because I get sensory overload, thousands of things, you know, 200 guns and all this camo and everything, but they had a little place called the Bargain Cave. I owned the Bargain Cave. They should have put my name up on it, Fred Bennett's room. I could win the Bargain Cave. I found returns, catalog returns, things that were slightly damaged, uh, things that were no longer produced. Uh, I always got a good deal in there, but I didn't have as many choices it was like God eliminated the choice, the number of choices. So prioritizing is saying, okay, God, you know what's best. Help me out here because there's just too much stuff on the plate. Uh, I want to know what I need to do to stay in your will, in your plan, what I need to do and be to give credibility to who you really are. Um, in, um, let's see, Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to finish up with this and then I'll come back next week and finish the rest of this section and go into Dr. MacArthur's book. In Matthew chapter 6. And it's a very familiar passage, but man, the, the, the awesome simple principles of prioritizing are right here. Chapter 6, verse 25 to 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious. And that means 
anxious to distraction, uh, upset to where you can't focus, uh, you can't keep your mind on the right things. Um, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, or about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. And by the way, when Jesus said that, I told people, he wasn't saying, think about it. He said, look at those birds. They're flying by. Look at them. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much? Are you not of more value than they? You know, this is a passage that talks about the inequality between human beings and animals. Animals are not the same as human beings. No animal on the earth has a soul. Mankind is God's only creation on this earth that has a soul and a spirit, along with a body, a consciousness of God, an understanding of him, ability to understand him. Aren't you more than them, Jesus said? And which of you, by being anxious to distraction, can add one single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious? Three times he talks about it, about clothing. Consider the lilies of the field. He picks some up out of the field. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. I tell you, Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious to distraction, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them. He says, your Father feeds them. Your Father knows that you need them, but seek first in the matter of priority and time and position, that word first, a priority, first in time, first in position, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, prioritizing, and all these things shall be added to you. What you need will be given to you by your father, your father who knows your father who feeds the animals will take care of you. Therefore, do not be anxious to distraction about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious to distraction for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. First, seeking the kingdom of God in time. Oh, I missed one word on there. First in time, place, order, and importance. This is how we prioritize, we put God first. It's very simple. And Jesus said, my father takes care of the animals. He's going to take care of you. Do not be anxious to distraction. Next week, we'll come back with uh, point H, live like you're dying. And then we'll go right into, well, that's Philippians 1. I'll remind you of that next week. And uh, then we'll go into the leadership book and finish this series. Um, God bless you. Let's, let's do this. Just do it like Nike says. Father, thank you for being amazing. Your word is so searching and penetrating. If we follow your spirit and follow your word, we are led in the paths of righteousness. We are led in your way. We prioritize godly prioritizing. Uh, Lord God, may we follow you well, closely, May we be found in you. May we be your people um, so that others will know what you're like and we'll be able to be vessels to touch their lives through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.